Hello, everyone. I'm Billy. And I'm Comron. Welcome to the Horse Frog Podcast, home of your two favorite professional digressors and the creators of the Malazan Brotherhood. Today, we will be discussing Book 2, Chapter 7 of Memories of Ice, a novel in the Malazan Books of the Fallen. This is Part 3 of our coverage of this chapter. This podcast series is intended to be a companion to reading or listening to the books set in the Malazan universe. It's not a book review, and it is most definitely not intended to be a replacement to reading the books. Both Billy and I know Pestify. this to be the best fantasy story ever written and want to share our love of the series with you. We will be covering the events of the books in a linear fashion, and there will be spoilers for those that have not read the books. We'll try not to spoil anything prior to us covering that portion of the respective book. And since we're just beginning, we're both working very hard, and I don't even want to say the rest of that sentence. We're working very hard. <laughs> A quick warning, today's episode contains hints of past violence and possible future violence, and is not suitable yes. for young listeners. Discretion is advised. Threats may be exchanged. <laughs> uh, our, our show is listener-supported, and if you'd like to support us, we'd really appreciate that. You can do so by visiting our Patreon link on our website at horsefrogproductions.com. Currently, we're posting ad-free episodes on Patreon weekly. Also, we'd really like to hear from you. Send any feedback or comments to contact at horsefrogproductions.com. All right, Chapter 7, Part 3. We go to Lady Envy's location. Blood had filled the gutters not long past. Sun and absence of rain had preserved the evidence. No one in Callows had been spared. She came upon the heaped pyres on her approach down the inland road and judged the slaughter at perhaps 30,000. Gareth ranged ahead, slipping beneath the arch of the gate. She followed at a slower pace. The city had been beautiful once. Copper-sheathed domes, minarets, poetically winding streets overlooked by ornate balconies, riotous with flowering plants. Geographically, Callows is north of Morn on the western coast of Genabacus. Okay. A trader city, a merchant's paradise. The masts of countless ships were visible in the harbor ahead, all motionless, indicating that the crafts had been holed and sat one and all in the mud of the bay. Ten days, no more, since the slaughter. She could smell Hood's breath, a sigh at unexpected bounty, a faint ripple of unease at what it signified. She thought, you are troubled, dear Hood. This bodes ill, indeed. Gareth led her unerringly, as she knew he would through an ancient, almost forgotten alleyway into a small, sagging house, its foundation stones of a far sharper cut than those that rested upon them. A single room lay within. Gareth circled the center. I find it interesting that the technology used to cut those stones that are older was more precise than that of the later people that came and settled this area. Yeah, you know what? It's kind of strange and interesting to me. Is it always seems that there's always some kind of degradation. You know, some of the earlier people might have been smarter in some ways, even though they had less technology, let's say. <laughs> technology, it makes us lazy sometimes. Even today, for us to craft the pyramids the way they were originally created, it'd be a monumental task. I'm pretty sure we could do it, mm. but it would... <laughs> take more resources than anybody is willing oh, yeah. to commit to something like that but to do it by hand in the same way that they did it oh man the craftsmanship anymore for that kind of stuff yes yes agreed it's different <laughs> it's one of those things you're still around man <laughs> lady envy approached kicked aside the reed mats no trap door the inhabitants had no idea of what lay beneath their home she unveiled her warren passed a hand over the floorboards watched them dissolve into dust creating a circular hole, a damp, salty breath wafted from its darkness. Gareth padded to the edge, then dropped out of sight. She heard the clatter of claws some distance below. With a sigh, Lady Envy followed. No stairs, and the paved stones of the floor were a long time in slowed fall. Again, I'm left wondering at what capabilities he has. That's a pretty long distance to simply land without any injury. Yeah, agreed. I just really can't remember what was said a whole lot about Gareth, other than he's what some kind of hound like type thing giant hound like as big as a hound of shadow almost yeah i always pictured him as is that bow jag or him well they're both huge and i think i always pictured him as about the size of the hounds of shadow okay i pictured him as one of those burboels the dog that oh, yeah, they yeah. bred in south africa to protect the farms from lions kind of yes. a <laughs> would you say dapper with sure. a kind of a dark ears dark nose yeah the, the, I, I kind of agree with that. I remember when you first shared that picture with me. Those are magnificent animals. But uh, yeah, that would still be a hard, long fall for the kind of the bigger you are. Those are more inertia behind you, isn't it, when you, <laughs> when you land? Yeah, it's not a cat. So it makes me think that there's some sorceress 
capability at display here. Yeah, probably so. Vision enhanced, Lady Envy looked around, then sniffed. The temple was all of this one chamber, squalid, once low-ceilinged, though the beams of that roof had long since vanished. There was no raised altar stone, but she knew that for this particular ascendant, the entire floor of cut stone served that sacred function. Back in the days of blood. Eyes on Gareth, she said, I can imagine what awakened this place to you. All that blood seeping down, dripping, dripping onto your altar. I admit I prefer your abode in Darujistan. Far grander, almost worthy of complimenting my esteemed presence. But this, her nose wrinkled. Little fun side note here. I've been using the Kindle book as a basis for my notes. And in this mm. last sentence, Kindle says, far gruntler instead of far <laughs> grander. And this confused the heck out of me. I, I was, what is he trying to say here? Because gruntler was capitalized. And I double checked Kindle to make sure I hadn't made a mistake. That's what it says. I go and I get the paperback <laughs> copy of the book and it says grander. And I'm like, wow, that's a pretty serious typo in the scanned book for Kindle. Yeah, I'll never forget some of the early, I noticed that as well. I had the same, it's not the same thing, but on some of, some other Kindle things I've owned, sometimes there's a lot of, we call that artifacts on the Kindle where it, it's weird, I guess the scanning misinterprets things or something, because sometimes it's really close. And so a lot of times you're uh, in Kindle stuff, some of the earlier things I was more able to go, okay, I, was, I learned to read over that stuff mm -hmm. easier. Because <laughs> the first stuff I read on the Kindle was, strangely enough, these books. So Gave you an excuse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it did give me an excuse, dude. I think it was the same uh, for me. Yeah, I believe so. Right on. I think I got the Kindle while i was reading these and then okay. it made it a lot easier for me to instead of having to carry a book around i just had it and then yeah. aside from the kindle once the kindle app was on the phone i figured out i could switch the background to black with white text i just always have my phone mm -hmm. with me so i basically always have them and right. other books too that's cool that's I, I read really all the great. black company on yes. there i never got those on paperback I, I love that stuff yeah it's good gareth eyes closed twitched in her mind lady envy heard welcome lady envy Lady Envy said, your summons was uncharacteristically distraught, cruel. Is this the work of the matron and her undead hunters? If so, then calling me here was unnecessary. I am well aware of their efficacy. Cruel said, crippled and chained he may be, Lady Envy, but this particular god is never so obvious. His game displays a master's sleight of hand. Nothing is as he would have us believe, and his use of unwitting servants is as brutal as his treatment of enemies. Consider, after all, the Panion Seer. No, for Kalos, death came from the sea. A warren twisted fleet, cold-eyed, unhuman killers, seeking, ever seeking. They now ply the world's oceans. Ooh, this is an interesting tidbit. Mm. A new force has entered the fray. Yeah, I'm wondering who. Um, I don't remember. To kill 30,000 people, sink all these ships, that is formidable. Yeah. And then they just left by the sea as well. They didn't stay. Yeah, and what's worse, are they, are they affiliated with the Panions? We have no idea. Yeah, that's true. When I made the note about geographical location of Kalos, I did think it was strange for the Panion Daman to be operating on this side of the continent while making a major push for Kapustan. Another force committing this atrocity definitely makes more sense when you think of it that way. Yes, it does. Lady Envy asked, seeking what, dare I ask? Cruel said, a worthy challenge, no less. Lady Envy asked, and do these dreadful seaborne murderers have a name? Cruel said, one enemy at a time, Lady Envy. You must cultivate patience. She crossed her arms and said, You sought me out, Cruel, and you can be certain that I had not anticipated that you and I would ever meet again. The Elder Gods are gone, and good riddance as far as I'm concerned, and that includes my father, Draconis. Were we companions 200,000 years ago, you and I? I think not, though the memories are admittedly vague. Not enemies, true enough, but friends, allies, most certainly not. Yet here you have come. I have gathered your own unwitting servants, as you asked. Have you any idea the demands on my energies to hold those three Segula in check? Karul said, ah, yes. And where is the third now? Lady Envy said, stretched senseless half a league from the city. It was vital to get him away from that Talani mass. The gods know I didn't drag him along for the company. You're missing my point, Karul. The Segula will not be controlled. Indeed, I wonder who humors whom when it comes to those three frightful warriors. Mock will challenge Tool. Mark my words, and while a part of me thrills at the thought to witness such a clash, nonetheless, 
The destruction of one or the other will ill suit your plans, I imagine. The first sword was almost defeated by Thirul, you know. Mock will chop him into kindling. Real quick, I didn't pick this up yeah. when I read through this recently. Karul asked her to bring the Segula. That's based on his request. And I didn't even notice that. Yeah, I didn't really notice that either. Because there's so much, this past couple chapters have been so dense with so much stuff going on. It's like, holy smokes. You know, and right, right as we come through it, I'm like, you're like, wow. He called for her to, to get them fellas and come over. <laughs> and it's like, gee whiz, that's, uh, that's pretty wild, man. Mm -hmm. And I do wonder what toll is taking on her to hold them in check. But apparently it's a lot more than we're seeing. Karul's soft laughter filled her head. He said, hopefully not before Mock and his brothers have carved their way into the Panion Seer's throne room. Besides, Ono's tool land is far more subtle of thought than you might imagine, Lady Envy. Let them battle, if Mock so chooses. I suspect, however, that the third may well surprise you with his... Constraint. Lady Envy said, Constraint? Tell me, Cruel, did you think the Segula first would send someone as highly ranked as the third to lead his punitive army? Cruel said, Admittedly, no. For this task of splitting the Seer's forces into two fronts, I had expected perhaps three or four hundred eleventh level initiates sufficient to inconvenience the seer enough to draw an army or two away from the approaching Malazans. Yet with the second missing, and with Mock's growing prowess, no doubt the first had his reasons. Lady Envy said, One final question then. Why am I doing you these favors anyway? Karul said, As petulant as ever, I see. Very well. You chose to turn your back on the need when last it arose. Disappointing that. Yet enough did indeed attend to manage the chaining, although at a cost that your presence would have diminished. But, even chained, the crippled god will not rest. He exists in endless, tormenting pain, shattered, broken within and without. Yet he has turned that into a strength, the fuel for his rage, his hunger for vengeance. And I do appreciate how the crippled god found a way to beat the gods and ascendants at their own game instead of simply lying there and accepting his fate. Yeah, that's really impressive, dude. And I really appreciate that. I know all we're seeing from him is vitriol, hate. Yes. He's collecting all these individuals to try and do something with them. So not presenting in the best light. And if you think about the crippled God from his perspective, the poor guy <laughs> was ripped out of his realm, torn apart. You'd probably be pretty pissed off yeah, too. Yeah. You know? Agreed. Agreed. I don't really fault this fellow. You know, I don't fault him. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, I don't like seeing the characters that I really love getting the bad end of the deal going against the crippled God. Right. Lady Envy said, the fools who pulled him down are long dead, cruel. Vengeance is just an excuse. The crippled god is driven by ambition. Lust for power is the core of his rotten, shriveled heart. Karul said, perhaps, perhaps not. Time will tell, as the mortals say. In any case, you defy the summons at the chaining, Lady Envy. I will not brook your indifference a second time. She sneered and said, you? Are you my master, Karul? Since when? She was interrupted as visions flooded her mind, staggering her. Darkness, then chaos wild unfocused power a universe devoid of sense of control of meaning entities flung through the maelstrom lost terrified by the birth of light a sudden sharpening pain as of wrists opened the heat spilling forth a savage imposition of order the heart from which blood flowed in even steady streams twin chambers to that heart Kruald galane the warren of mother dark and starvald demolane the warren of dragons and the blood the power, now sweeping in currents through veins, through arteries, branching out through all existence, and the thought that came to her then stole all warmth from her flesh. Those veins, those arteries, they are the Warrens. We've often wondered at what came first, darkness or something else. Mm -hmm. And this last paragraph makes it sound like Starvald Demolane and Kruald Galane coexisted, then light came, then order was imposed upon the system. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I agree. And that's, man, that's, again, another massive info drop. Just in short bursts. It's like, wow. You speak with the angst and some man, just every sentence just drops you some info. That's like, holy moly, that answered a big question. Yeah. <laughs> Cruel speaks and we learn. <laughs> I mean, he was there. <laughs> you know? Yeah, he was there. Yeah. Lady Envy asked, who created this? Who? Cruel said, dear lady. You have your answer, and I will be damned if I am going to countenance your impertinence. You are a sorceress. By light's wild mane, your power feeds on the very blood of my eternal soul, and I will have your obedience in this. 
Lady Envy staggered another step, suddenly released by the visions, disorientated, her heart thudding in her chest. She drew in a sharp breath and asked, Who knows the... the truth, Cruel? She thought that in striding through the Warrens, we travel through your very flesh, that when we draw upon the power of the Warrens, we draw your very blood. She repeated, Who knows? She felt a casual shrug in his reply. He said, Anamander Rake, Draconis, Osric, a handful of others. And now you. Forgive me, Lady Envy. I have no wish to be a tyrant. My presence within the Warrens has ever been passive. You are free to do as you choose, as is every other creature who swims my immortal blood. I have but one excuse, if you will. This crippled god, this stranger from an unknown realm. Lady Envy, I am frightened. A chill stole through her as the words sank into her mind. Cruel continued after a moment. We have lost allies in our foolishness. Dasim Ultor. Dasim Ultor who was broken by Hood's taking of his daughter at the time of the chaining, this was a devastating blow. Dasim Ultor, the first sword reborn. I wonder at that. First sword reborn. From when? The first empire? Boy, that's a really good question. Let's just double back here real quick to where Cruel just told us that he's basically magic. Oh, yeah, good point. (laughs) He's the magic system of the universe. It's like, I'm the magic system of this universe. And don't ever don't ever <laughs> say no to me. You know, I was like, wow, okay. Mm. Okay, kind of slapped her there. Um, <laughs> Check her. Check, oh, sorry, 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 maybe. <laughs> so, oh, oh, oh. so uh, yeah, to see him uh, check her privilege there was quite, um, quite uh, amusing. <laughs> Lady Envy slowly asked, Do you think that Hood would have taken her for the chaining had I answered the summons? She wondered, Am I to blame for Dasim Ultor's loss? Cruel said, Hood alone could answer that question, Lady Envy. And he'd likely lie, in any case. Dasim, his champion, Decembra, had grown to rival his power. There is little value in worrying such questions, beyond the obvious lesson that inaction is a deadly choice. Consider... From Dasim's fall, a mortal empire now totters on the edge of chaos. From Dasim's fall, the Shadow Throne found a new occupant. From Dasim's fall, ah, well, the tumbling dominoes are almost countless. It is done. And that sounds like Dasim was incredibly important in keeping things together in the grand scheme of things. Yes, that's incredibly important. And had we known this bit before that Dasim, his champion, Dasim Bray, was the same yes that's been revealed yeah i thought it was but i was not i just want to make sure that that had i thought it had but golly this the ton of info here man this again wow it's like every sentence is just rocking me with cruel it's like that god dude (laughs) yeah and this kind of brought me back to the memory that fiddler and crocus and company found dasim ultor's daughter in tremorlore Mm -hmm. what is she doing there How'd she yeah. get there? Yeah. <laughs> Questions. <laughs> Questions I don't have answers to. <laughs> I know it. I know it. But at least I feel when I have something like this, it's like, ah, uh, we're getting somewhere closer. I don't know if we're getting closer or if I'm getting more distracted because I, it's not distracted. I, I, yeah, that's awful, Mr. Erickson. Oh, you give with one and you take away with more. It's like you, you give more questions and you give answers. It's good, though. <laughs> I like feeling like that because it's amazing. Dude. If I didn't feel like that, I wouldn't be interested in the series as much. Mm-hmm. If it's all handed to you, it's kind of a, just a throwaway thing in my view. I like working for it. Lady Envy asked, what is it you wish of me now? Cruel. Cruel said there was need to show you the vastness of the threat. This Panion Domin is but a fragment of the whole, yet you must lead my chosen into its very heart. Lady Envy asked, And once there, am I a match for the power that resides there? Cruel said, Perhaps, but that is a path it may prove unwise to take, Lady Envy. I shall trust in your judgment, and in that of others, unwitting and otherwise. Indeed, you may well choose to cut the knot that is at the heart of the Domin, or you may find a way to loosen it. To free all that has been bound for three hundred thousand years. Lady Envy said, Very well. We shall play it as it comes. What joy! I can leave now? I so long to return to the others, to talk the younger in particular. He's a darling, isn't he? Karul said, take great care of him, lady. The scarred and the flawed are what the crippled god seeks in his servants. I shall endeavor to keep talk's soul from the chained one's grasp, but please maintain your guard. Also, there is something else to the man, something 
wild. We shall have to await its awakening before understanding comes to us, however. Oh, one last thing. She said, yes? Cruel said, your party nears the Domin's territory. When you return to them, you must not attempt your warren in an effort to hasten your journey. She asked, why? Cruel said, within the Panyan Domin, lady, my blood is poisoned. It is a poison you can defeat, but talk that younger cannot. Gareth awoke, rose and stretched before her. Karul was gone. Lady Envy was suddenly soaked in sweat. She whispered, oh my, poisoned. By the abyss, I need a bath. Come, Gareth, let us go collect the third. Shall I awaken him with a kiss? Gareth glanced over at her. Lady Envy said, twin scars on his mask and the imprints of painted <laughs> lips. Would he be the fourth then or the fifth? How do they count lips, do you think? One upper, one lower, or both together? Let's find out. That would be mean. Why does she have to mess with the guy like that? Do you think that she feels that they're too uptight? <laughs> kind of how I make fun of the gray swords a little bit. You know, there's probably some of that in there, but from what we have, you know, we've only got to know her in this book so far, and everything about her, she's pretty capricious, appearingly, you know, appears to be kind of capricious, but she's very long lived. And so these. Ascendants, man, I'm assuming it gets kind of boring at some point, and you got to mess with the folks at some point. And, you know, so she's going to have her good time while she's forced to try and maintain some kind of control, which is apparently costing her more than we can see. So I think she's just trying to get her little joy out of it. <laughs> when she was arguing with Cruel, she, I expected her to stamp her foot practically, <laughs> having a little fit. Yeah, she's very, very much like that. That's pretty funny. She's used to getting her way, I take it. Oh. Yes, I'm assuming so. We go somewhere else. Dust and the dark swirl of sorcery rose beyond the hills directly ahead. Farrah Kalian said, Shield Anvil, have our allies already sprung a trap? Itkovian frowned and said, I do not know. No doubt we shall discover the truth when they elect to reappear and inform us. Farrah Kalian said, well, that is a fight before us, an ugly one, by the looks of the magic unleashed. Itkovian said, I'll not argue that observation, sir. Riders, reform as inverted crescent, hands to weapons, slow trot to the first line of sight. The decimated wing fell into formation, then rode on. They were close to the trader road now, Itkovian judged. If a caravan had been hit by some of these Kachain Chamal, the outcome was foregone. A caravan with an attendant mage or two might well make a fight of it, and from the brimstone stench that now wafted towards them, the latter circumstance seemed the likeliest. As they approached a rise, a row of Talani mass emerged to stand along its crest, backs to Akovian and his riders. He saw Pran Cole and angled his new horse in his direction. They reached the rise. The sorcerer's detonations had ceased, all sounds of battle fading away. The trader road ran below. Two carriages had made up the caravan. One much larger, both had been destroyed, ripped apart. On a low hill off to the right lay three figures, the ground blackened around them. None moved. Eight more bodies were visible around the wagons. Only two conscious, black, chain-armored men slowly regaining their feet. These details registered only briefly on Ekovian's senses. Wandering among the dismembered corpses of five Kachain Chamal hunters were hundreds of huge, gaunt wolves with pitted eyes studying the silent, terrifying creatures Ekovian spoke to Pran Cole. Are these yours, sir? Pran Cole shrugged and said, gone from our company for a time. Talan A often accompany us, but are not bound to us beyond the ritual itself. He was silent for a long moment, then continued. We had thought them lost, but it seems that they too have heard the summons. Three thousand years since our eyes last rested upon the Talan A. Ekovian looked at Pran Cole and asked, Is that a hint of pleasure in your voice, Pran Cole? Pran Cole said, Yes, and sorrow. Ekovian said, Why sorrow? From the looks of it, these Talan A took not a single loss against these Kachain Chamal. Four, five hundred, against five. Swift destruction. Prankol nodded and said, Their kind are skilled at defeating large beasts. My sorrow arises from a flawed mercy, mortal. At the first gathering, our misplaced love for the A, these few that remained, led us onto a cruel path. We chose to include them in the ritual. Our selfish needs were a curse. All that made the flesh and blood A honorable, proud creatures, was taken away. Now, like us, they are husks, plagued by dead memories. Of ice. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty sad those poor animals and yes i feel it's kind of a heartrending because they are you can tell that they're sad that they did these to them like i said it's it's upset us that we took this honor from them so it is sad i think about how some of the talani mass chose not to partake the ritual 
And then that makes me think those that used to do so. Now they may have felt a certain amount of pressure because the rest of their tribe was doing it, but there were some that did not. The wolves had no choice. Mm -hmm. I guess from a mercy perspective, some of the previous conversations that we had from the Talani mass, they said they hunted everything to extinction practically. So the wolves wouldn't have had anything to hunt anyway. So I guess they thought, well, this might be better for them. But in hindsight, it didn't turn out to be so. Yeah. You hate to see animals suffering. Yep. <laughs> Agreed. Ekovian said, even undead, they have majesty, as with you. Prankol said, majesty in the Talan A, yes. Among the Talan I mass, no mortal, none. Ekovian said, we differ in opinion then, Prankol. He turned to address his soldiers and said, check the fallen. Ekovian rode down to the two chain-clad men who now stood together beside the remnants of the larger of the two carriages. Their ringed armor was in tatters. Blood leaked from them, forming pools at their feet. Something about the two men made Ikovian uneasy, but he pushed the emotion away. The bearded one swung to face Ikovian as he reined in before them. The man said, I bid you welcome, warrior. Extraordinary events just pass. Despite his inner discipline, Ikovian's unease deepened. He managed an even tone as he said, Indeed, sir. I am astonished, given the attention the Kel hunters evidently showed you to, that you are still standing. The man said, We are resilient individuals, in truth. Alas, our companions were found lacking in such resources. Ferrakalian, having conferred with the soldiers crouched among the fallen, now rode towards Idkovian. Ferrakalian said, Shield Anvil. Of the three Bargast on the hill, one lies dead. The other two are injured, but will survive with proper ministration. Of the rest, only one breathes no more. An array of injuries to attend to. Two may yet die, sir. None of these survivors has yet regained consciousness. Indeed, each seems in unusually deep sleep. Ikovian glanced at the bearded man and asked, Do you know more of this unnatural sleep, sir? The bearded man said, I am afraid not. He faced Ferrakalian and said, Sir, among the survivors, can you include a tall, lean, somewhat elderly man and a shorter, much older one? Ferrakalian said, I can. The former, however, hovers at the gates. The bearded man said, We'd not lose him, if at all possible. Itkovian spoke. Soldiers of the Grey Swords are skilled in the art of healing, sir. They shall endeavor to the best of their abilities, and no more can be asked of them. The bearded man said, Of course. I am distraught. Itkovian said, Understood. Then addressed Ferrakalian. Draw on the Destrian's power if necessary. Ferrakalian said, Yes, sir. He watched the man ride off. And this really surprised me, that they can pull power from the Destrian. That's a new one. I wonder if this applies to yeah. all gray swords or if there are only select few that can perform healing in this manner. That's a really good question because I'm, I'm like you have not seen this before. And well, I guess we'll just have to find out <laughs> that to ourselves. That's a very interesting. It's like he's a battery. It's like a node on a battery for the, the folks out in the field to get a hold of him. Yeah. And originally I thought this had something to do with Fainer, but he's high Denul, which I don't think has anything mm -hmm. to do with Fainer, actually. So it made me... Curious as to why we haven't seen that among anybody else yet. I don't recall a lot of high denial. The only real hint of it was that maybe remember Ben and the soul shifting of uh, Hairlock involves some inversion of some high denial. I thought Mallet was. was Mal He's denial, but I don't know if there's a difference between denial and high denial. Okay. Um. Hmm. Is, is okay. there a difference? And, and that's actually a good question. Uh, and the other, but the, for me, it's like maybe that's the pedestrians. That's his special ability. Maybe something. If these is this title, this type of person, they act as some kind of like you, like I was saying, some kind of battery that maybe maybe he can lend his because the other person said thus our soldiers are all capable healers. So can any of these soldiers access the Destrian's power, you know, that aren't even necessarily people that use stuff, but they can use his power? Is, you know, does that make sense? Good point. So it's like a combination. It, he went down two skill trees. He went down the Denul skill tree. And then when he got to the port and he switched over to the Destrian skill tree and then combining the two, <laughs> he got to a yeah, talent yeah. that unlocked the ability <laughs> to share <laughs> his Denul. Yeah, something. <laughs> It's, it's something. I'll accept that answer right now. We'll, maybe we'll hear some more. Until, until Cruel tells me what's going on there, they, I don't think we'll know. <laughs> <laughs> the bearded man said, Warrior, I am named Boshlane, and my companion here is Corball Brooch. I must ask, these undead servants of yours, four-footed and otherwise. It Covian corrected. Not servants, Boshlane, allies. 
These are Talan I Mass, the wolves. Talan A. Corbal Broach's eyes were bright as he said, Talan I Mass, undead, born of the greatest necromantic ritual there has ever been. I would speak with them. He swung to Boshley and asked, May I, please? Man, he's like a kid in a candy shop. Yeah. Yeah, weird kid in a candy shop. <laughs> Boshlain gave an indifferent shrug and said, as you wish. Ikovian said, a moment. You both bear wounds that require attending to. Boshlain said, no need, shield anvil, though I thank you for your concern. We heal swiftly. Please concentrate on our companions. Now, that is odd. Our beasts of burden and sundry horses are untouched. Do you see? Fortunate indeed, once I complete my repairs to our carriage. Ikovian studied the wreckage to which Boshlain now swung his attention. He thought, repairs? He said, sir, we return to Kapustan immediately. There will be no time to spare affecting repairs to your carriage. Boshlane said, I shall not be long, I assure you. A shout from the ridge pulled Ikovian round, in time to see Korbal flying backwards from a backhanded blow delivered by Pran Cole. <laughs> <laughs> he got a little, a little too familiar with them, I take it. <laughs> yeah. At least, at least Pran Cole didn't kill Korbal, bro. <laughs> yeah. At least it didn't appear to me. Boshlane sighed and said, he lacks manners, alas, the price of a sheltered, nay, isolated childhood. I hope the Talani Mass are not too offended. Tell me, Shield Anvil, do these undead warriors hold grudges? Ikovian allowed himself a private smile as he thought. You can ask that of the next Jagoot we happen across. He said, I wouldn't know, sir. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> From the ruins of the smaller carriage, three wide travois were cobbled together. The Talani mass fashioned leather harnesses for the undead A, chosen to pull them. The caravan's collection of horses went under the care of Farrakalian and the recruit. Ikovian watched Corbal Broach lead the oxen back to the rebuilt carriage. He found his gaze avoiding the contraption. The details in the mending made his skin crawl. Boshlane had elected to use the various bones of the dismembered Kachain Chamal hunters in the reconstruction. <laughs> Sorcerously melded into the carriage's frame, the bones formed a bizarre skeleton. The effect was horrific. A Covian thought, yet no more so than the carriage's owners, I suspect. <laughs> what a sight that would be. Quite fitting for the people traveling within. Oh, it would be horrific. You almost have to have this, get a, san uh, a, a sanity roll <laughs> to see if you suffer any ill effects from seeing this thing ride by. It's like, Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> A bone skeletal carriage wrapped in this sickly dead lizard skin? Come on now. Terrible. <laughs> These guys are weird, man. I love it. <laughs> Prankful appeared at Ikovian's side and said, Our preparations are complete, soldier. Ikovian nodded, then said in a low voice, Bonecaster, what do you make of these two sorcerers? Prankful said, The unmanned one is insane, yet the other is the greater threat. They are not welcome company, Shield Anvil. Ikovian's eyes narrowed on Corbal Brooch. He said, unmanned? A eunuch, yes, of course. They are necromancers? Prankul said, yes, the unmanned one plies the chaos on the edge of Hood's realm. The other has more arcane interests, a summoner of formidable power. Ikovian said, we cannot abandon them, nonetheless. Prankul said, as you wish. He hesitated, then said, Shield Anvil. The injured mortals are, one and all, dreaming. Ikovian asked, dreaming? Prankol said, a familiar flavor. They are being protected. I look forward to their awakening, in particular the priest. Your soldiers displayed considerable skill in healing. Ikovian said, our destrian is high Dinul. We are able to draw on his power in times of need, though I imagine his mood is dark at the moment. Exhausted, knowing that healing has occurred, but little else. Carnatus dislikes uncertainty, as does the mortal sword, Brucalian. He gathered his reins, straightened in the saddle, and said, The eunuch has completed his task. We may now proceed. We shall ride through the night, sir, greeting the dawn at Capustan's gates. Prankol asked, In the presence of the Talan I mass and the Talan A? Itkovian said, Hidden, if you please. Excepting those A pulling the Trovoi, they shall lead their charges through the city and into the compound in our barracks. Prankol asked, And you have reason for this, shield anvil? Itkovian nodded. It was probably to scare everyone and clear a path. <laughs> I agree. That'd be very effective. <laughs> the sun low at their backs, the entourage set off. Hands folded on his lap, the destrian looked upon Prince Jellarkan with deep sympathy. No, more than that. Given the man's obvious exhaustion, empathy. 
Carnadus's Danul Warren felt hollow. Were he to have left his hands on the tabletop, their tremble would have been obvious. Behind him, the mortal sword Brucalian paced. Itkovian and two wings rode the plain to the west. And something had happened. Concern echoed in every restless step at Carnadus' back. Jellarkin's eyes were squeezed shut, fingers kneading his temples beneath the circlet of cold hammered copper that was his crown. Twenty-two years old, his lined, drawn face could have belonged to a man of forty. After a long sigh, Jellarkin said, The Mass Council will not be swayed, mortal sword. They insist that their Gidrath occupy the outlying strong points. Brucalian rumbled, Those fortifications will become isolated once the siege begins, prince. Jellarkin said, I know. We both know. Isolated. Dismantled. Every soldier within slaughtered. Then, <laughs> the priests fancy themselves master strategists in warfare. A religious war, after all. The temple's own elite warriors must strike the first blows. Brucalian said, no doubt they will, and little else. Jellarkin said, and little else. Perhaps corridors, a series of sorties to effect a withdrawal. Brucalian said, costing yet more lives, prince, and likely to fail. My soldiers will not be partied to suicide, and please do not attempt to impose your will on me in this. We are contracted to hold the city. In our judgment, the best means of doing so are within maintaining the walls. The redoubts have always been a liability. They will serve the enemy better than they will serve us, as headquarters. The Gidrath will be handing them fortifications in the killing ground. Once siege weapons are stationed there, we shall suffer ceaseless bombardment. Jellarkan said, The Mass Council does not expect the strong points to fall, mortal sword. Nailed to that particular belief, all your stated fears are irrelevant, as far as they are concerned. There was silence, apart from Brucalian's uncharacteristic pacing. Jellarkan looked up finally, frowned, then sighed and pushed himself to his feet. He said, I need leverage, mortal sword. Find it for me, and quickly. He swung about and strode to the chamber where waited his two bodyguards. As soon as the massive doors closed behind the prince, Brucalian spun to Carnidus and asked, Do they continue to draw on your powers, sir? Carnidus shook his head, then said, Not for some time, now, since shortly after the prince's unexpected visit. In any case, sir, they have taken all I possess, and it will be days before I fully recover. Brucalian released a long, slow breath, then said, Well, the risk of a skirmish was recognized. From this we must conclude that the Panion has sent forces across the river. The question is, how many? Carnidus said, sufficient to maul two wings, it seems. Brucalian said, then Itkovian should have avoided the engagement. Carnidus studied Brucalian as he said, unworthy, sir. The shield anvil understands caution. If avoidance was possible, he would have done so. Brucalian growled, I, I know. I was making fun of the way these guys talked sometimes, but I like that unworthy, sir. Do you think that'll work for the kids if I try it on them? Your oldest, <laughs> possibly. He may be at that age where that might be taken well. Your youngers, man, they just roll their eyes at you be like, whatever. <laughs> Voices of the compound's outer gates reached through to the two men. Hooves clapped on the cobbles. Sudden tension filled the chamber, yet neither man spoke. The doors swung open and they turned to see at Covian's outrider, Sidless, who took two steps into the room, then halted and tilted her head. She said, mortal sword, destriant. I bring word from the shield anvil. Brucalian murmured, You have seen battles, sir. Sidless said, We have. A moment, sirs. Sidless swung about and softly shut the doors. She faced the two men and said, Demonic servants of the Panion Seer are present on the plain. We came upon one and closed with it. The tactics employed should have sufficed, and the damage we delivered was severe and flawless. The beast, however, was undead, an animated corpse. And this discovery came too late for disengagement. It was virtually impervious to the wounds we delivered. Nevertheless, we succeeded in destroying the demon, though at great cost. Carnidus said, Outrider Sidless, the battle you describe must have occurred some time past, else you would not be here. Yet the demands on my powers of healing have but just ended. Sidless frowned and said, The survivors of the engagement did not require a drawing of your powers, sir. If I may, I will complete the tale. Raising an eyebrow at the awkward reply, Brucalian rumbled, Proceed. Sidless said, Upon the destruction of the demon, we regrouped, only to find that four additional demons had arrived. Carnidus winced as he thought, How, then, are any of you left breathing? Sidless continued, At that moment, to our fortune, unexpected allies arrived. The undead demons were one and all swiftly destroyed. The issue of said alliance, of course, needs formalization. For the moment, it is the recognition of a common enemy that yielded the combined efforts, which I believe continue at this moment, with the shield anvil and the troop riding in the company of our propitious companions. Their intent to extend the hunt for more of these fell demons. Brucalian said, Given the Destrian's exhaustion, they found them, it seems. 
Sidless nodded. Carnivus asked, There is more, sir? Sidless said, Sir, accompanying me are emissaries from these potential allies. The shield and will judge that such negotiation as may follow be solely between the Grey Swords and our guests, and that any decisions of revelation to the prince or to the mass council should only follow considered counsel among yourselves, sirs. Brucalian grunted his agreement, then asked, The emissaries await in the compound? The answer to his question rose in swirls of dust to Sidless left. Three desiccated, fur-clad figures shimmered into being, rising up from the stone floor, rotted furs and leathers, skin polished deep brown, massive shoulders and long, muscle-twisted arms. Carnivus staggered back out of his chair, eyes wide. Brucalian had not moved. His eyes narrowed on the three apparitions. The air suddenly smelled of thawed mud. I expected rotten ice. Yeah, there. <laughs> yeah me too. Sidless calmly said, They call themselves the Kron Talani Mass. The shield anvil judged their warriors to number perhaps 14,000. Carnidus whispered, Talani Mass. This is a most disturbing convergence. Sidless continued, If I may make introductions, these are bone casters, shamans. The one to the far left, upon whose shoulders is the fur of a snow bear, is Bek Okan. Next to him, in the white wolf fur, is Bendal Home. The bone caster at my side, in the skin of a plains bear, is Okral Lom. I specify the nature of the furs as it relates directly to their soul-taken forms, or so they have informed me. Bendel Holmes stepped forward and said, I bring greeting from Kron of Kron Talani Mass Mortal. Further, I have recent news from the clans escorting your shield anvil and his soldiers. Additional Kachain Chamal Kael hunters were found engaged in an attack on a caravan. These hunters have been dispatched. Your soldiers have administered to the wounds of the caravan survivors. All are now returning to Kapustan. No further engagements are anticipated, and their arrival will coincide with the dawn. Trembling, Carnidus once more sat down in his chair. He struggled to speak past a suddenly parched throat. He asked, Kachain Chamal? Animated? Brucalian said, Thank you, Sidless. You may now depart. He faced Bendal home, then said, Do I understand correctly that Kron seeks an alliance against the Panyan Daman and these Kachain Chamal? Bendal home cocked his head and said, Such a battle is not our primary task. We have come to this land in answer to a summons. The presence of Kachain Chamal was unexpected and unacceptable. Further, we are curious as to the identity of the one named Panyan. We suspect he is not the mortal human you believe him to be. Kron has judged that our involvement in your conflict is required for the present. There is a caveat, however. The one who has summoned us approaches. With her arrival, the second gathering of the Talani Mass will commence. At this time, our disposition will be for her to decide. Furthermore, it may well be that we become of less value to you upon completion of the gathering. This statement that the presence of the Kachain Chamal was unacceptable. I thought only the Jagut were an issue for the Talani Mass. Seems like a distraction for the primary mission, unless they can tell that they are being controlled by something in the Panyan Daman, and their investigation into the Jagut name Panyan coincides with that. What do you think? That would be my guess, is that they're looking into this Panyan situation, because as we know, these fellows do not like the Jagut whatsoever. But from what we have seen, the Jagut tyrants seem to like to mind control huge chunks of populations. So they may spot a pattern. This may be how they kind of start things. And then the, and the, the Talani mass are like, okay, here we go. <laughs> and I got, it, it's creeping up over here. Okay, here we okay, go. Got it. <laughs> Jagut spotting over by Kapistan. <laughs> <laughs> Brucalian slowly turned to Carnidus and asked, sir, you have questions for the one named Bendal home? Carnidus said, so many that I do not know where to begin, mortal sword. Bonecaster, what is this gathering that you speak of? Bendel Holmes said, that is a matter for the Talani mass, mortal. Carnidus said, I see. Well, that shuts the door on one line of inquiry and its attendant multitude of questions. Regards the Panion seer. He is indeed a mortal human. I have seen him myself, and there is no scent of allusion to his flesh and bone. He is an old man and nothing more. Beck Okan rasped. And who stands in his shadow? Carnus blinked, then said, No one, as far as I can tell. The three Talani mass said nothing, yet Carnus suspected a silent exchange among them, and perhaps with their distant kin as well. And going back to what you said, that's interesting that Carnus just confirmed the Panion Seer is in fact a man, not a Jagut. So, what the heck is going on here? Yeah, again, 
that comment about who stands in his shadow. Mm-hmm. Who stands in his shadow? In a low voice, Carnida said, Mortal Sword, do we inform the prince of this? What are the Mask Council? Brucalian said, Further counsel is indeed required before that decision can be made, sir. At the very least, we shall await the return of the shield anvil. Furthermore, there is the issue of additional communications this night, is there not? Carnidus thought, Feyner's blessing, I'd forgotten. He said, Indeed there is. Then thought, Quick Ben, by the cloven hoof, we have allies stepping out of every closet. <laughs> Bendel Holmes spoke. Mortal Sword Brucalian, your soldier at Covian has decided that their public arrival into the city, with the company of the caravan's wounded, will include six of the Talan A that now accompany our kin. Carnidus asked, Talan A, not a name I've heard before. Bendel Holmes said, Wolves from the times of ice long ago. Like us, undead. Brucalian smiled. A moment later, Carnidus also smiled and said, The prince asked for leverage, did he not, mortal sword? Brucalian said, He shall have it, sir. Carnidus said, So he shall. Bendelholm said, If you have further need of us this evening, simply call upon us. Brucalian said, Thank you, sirs. The three Talani mass fell into clouds of dust. Carnidus said, I take it we need not offer our guests accommodation. Brucalian said, Evidently not. Walk with me, sir. We have much to discuss and scant time. Carnus rose and said, No sleep this night. Brucalian said, None, alas. Two bells before dawn, Brucalian stood alone in his private chamber. Exhaustion hung on him like a rain-sodden cloak, yet he would not yield to it. Ecovian and his troop were soon to arrive, and Brucalian was determined to await them. A commander could do no less. A single lantern defied the gloom in the chamber, throwing lurid shadows before it. The center hearth remained a gray smudge of dead coals and ashes. The air was bitter cold, and it was this alone that kept Brucalian wakeful. The meeting with Quick Ben and Caladan Brood had proved, beneath its surface courtesies, strained. It was clear to both Brucalian and Cardinus that their distant allies were holding back. The uncertainties plaguing their final intentions, and their guardedness, though understandable in the circumstances, left the two gray swords uncomfortable. Relief of Kafustan was not, it seemed, their primary goal. An attempt would be made, but Brucalian began to suspect it would be characterized by feints and minor skirmishes, late arriving at best, rather than a direct confrontation. This led Brucalian to suspect that Caladan Brood's vaunted army, worn down by years of war with this Malazan Empire, had either lost the will to fight or was so badly mauled that its combat effectiveness was virtually gone. Nonetheless, he could still think of ways in which to make these approaching allies useful. Often the perception of threat was sufficient. He thought, if we can hurt the Septarch badly enough to make him lose his nerve upon the imminent arrival of Brood's relieving army, or if the defense crumbled, then an avenue of withdrawal for the Grey Swords was possible. The question then would be, at what point could the Mortal Sword honorably conclude that the contract's objectives no longer obtained? The death of Prince Jellarkan, Collapse of wall defenses? Loss of a section of the city? He sensed the air suddenly tear behind him. A breath of lifeless wind flowed around him. Brucalian slowly turned. A tall, gauntly armored figure was visible within the warren's gray smeared portal. A face of pallid, lined skin over taut bones, eyes set deep within ridge sockets and brow, the glimmer of tusks protruding above the lower lip. The figure's mouth curved into a faint, mocking smile. It said, Feyner's mortal sword. I bring you greetings from Hood, Lord of Death. Brucalian grunted but said nothing. After a moment, the apparition went on. Warrior, your reaction to my arrival seems almost laconic. Are you truly as calm as you would have me believe? Brucalian replied, I am Feyner's mortal sword. The Jagut drawled, Yes, I know. I, on the other hand, am Hood's herald, once known as Gethel. The tale that lies behind my present servitude is more than worthy of an epic poem. Or three, are you not curious? Brucalian said, no. <laughs> Good gum, <God>, burn. <laughs> Sounds like he wants to tell this story. Yeah, no one wants to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> the Herald of Death is a Jagoot. These Jagoot are crawling out of the woodwork. Yeah. What have the Talan IMS been doing all these years? All these folks are just, all these elder races, everybody's just, everybody's coming out of the woodwork. Mm -hmm. I can't wait till we get to the party. Oh. <laughs> Fun fact, Gethel has been mentioned once in the books thus far. Wow. Someone cursing in Gardens of the Moon. He said Gethel's breath, and it was used by an unnamed man <laughs> speaking to Perrin when he was within Dragnapur. Wow, nicely spotted, sir.
Nicely spotted. Kindle does have its uses. Word search being one of them. Yes, it does. It's very yeah. true. <laughs> very, very true. Gethel's face fell into exaggerated despondency. Then his eyes flashed and he said, How unimaginative of you, mortal sword. Very well, here then, without comforting preamble, the words of my lord. While none would deny Hood's eternal hunger, and indeed his anticipation for the siege to come, Certain complexities of the greater scheme lead my lord to venture an invitation to Feyner's mortal soldiers. Brucalian rumbled, Then you should be addressing the tusked one himself, sir. Gethel said, Ah, alas, this has proved no longer possible, mortal sword. Feyner's attention is elsewhere. In fact, your lord has been drawn, with great reluctance, to the very edge of his realm. The herald's unhuman eyes narrowed, then he said, Feyner is in great peril. The loss of your patron's power is imminent. The time has come, Hood has decided, for compassionate gestures, for expressions of the true brotherhood that exists between your lord and mine. And that's interesting. Going back to our conversation last week, we were wondering how Feyner being drawn into the mortal realm would impact the Grey Swords. And it sounds like it's going to happen soon, or it's already happened. Yes, and the crazy thing on that one is it also sounds like these fellows will be cut off. As far as access to any Fainer's Warren. I would assume so. Yeah, me too. That's what I'm guessing. Brucalian asked, What does Hood propose, sir? Gethel said, This city is doomed, mortal sword. Yet your formidable army need not join in the inevitable crush at Hood's gate. Such a sacrifice would be pointless, and indeed a great loss. The Panyan Domin is no more than a single, rather minor, element in a far vaster war. A war in which all the gods shall partake, allied one and all against an enemy who seeks nothing less than the annihilation of all rivals. Thus, Hood offers you his warren, a means of extrication for you and your soldiers. Yet you must choose quickly, for the warren's path here cannot survive the arrival of the Panyan's forces. Brucalian said, What you offer, sir, demands the breaking of our contract. Gethel gave a contemptuous laugh and said, As I told Hood, you humans are a truly pathetic lot. A contract? Scratchings on vellum? My lord's offer is not a thing to be negotiated. Brucalian quietly said, and in accepting Hood's warren, the face of our patron changes, yes? Feyner's inaccessibility has made him a liability. And so Hood acts quickly, eager to strip the boar of Summer's mortal servants, preferably intact, to therefore serve him and him alone. Gethel sneered and said, Foolish man, Feyner shall be the first casualty in the war with the crippled god. The boar shall fall and none can save him. The patronage of Hood is not casually offered, mortal, to just anyone. To be so honored, Brucalian interrupted. Honored? Allow me, on Feyner's behalf, to comment on the question of honor. His broadsword hissed in a blur from its scabbard, the blade cleaving upward to strike Gethel across the face. Bone snapped, dark blood sprayed. Gethel reared back a step withered hands rising to his shattered features. Brucalian lowered his weapon, his eyes burning with a deep rage. He said, come forward again, Harold, and I shall resume my commentary. Through torn lips, Gethel rasped, I do not appreciate your tone. It falls to me to answer in kind, not on Hood's behalf, not any more. No, this reply shall be mine and mine alone. A long sword appeared in each gauntleted hand, the blades shimmering like liquid gold. Gethel's eyes glittered like mirrors to the weapons. He took a step forward. It seems that Gethel never learned the lesson of catching more flies with honey than vinegar. What a pathetic attempt to recruit somebody. Really, really weak. And the other thing, though, that's kind of intriguing, though, to me, is that Hood, which we don't know enough about this fella yet, but I'm assuming a god of death, just a, one that just constantly consumes... You know, there's no shut off on his power, I don't think, because people are constantly going there, whether he wants them there or not, or coming to his realm, is willing to offer these fellas a position, shall we say, as his soldiers. I wonder if it's because of this old titles or something like this, if he's intrigued by that, or if he, you know, just having some mortal agents always mm. helps with these people, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure either. I'm just intrigued by the fact that he would offer it to him. Gethel stopped in his advance, swords lifting into a defensive position. A soft voice spoke behind Brucalian. We greet you, Jagoot. Oh, man. It's so sick. <laughs> I would love to see this scene. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Brucalian turned to see the three Talani masks, each one strangely insubstantial, as if moments from veering into their soul-taken beasts. 
the air filled with a stale stench of spice. Gethel hissed, not your concern this fight. Beck Okan said, the fight with this mortal? No. However, Jagoot, you are. Gethel said, I am Hood's Herald. Do you dare challenge a servant of the Lord of Death? Beck Okan's desiccated lips peeled back, and he said, why would we hesitate, Jagoot? Now ask of your lord, does he dare challenge us? Gethel grunted as something dragged him bodily back, the warren snapping shut, swallowing him. The air swirled briefly in the wake of the portal's sudden vanishing, then settled. Beck Okan said, evidently not. Brukhalian sighed and sheathed his sword, then faced the Talani mass bonecasters. He said, your arrival has left me disappointed, sirs. Beck Okan said, we understand this, mortal sword. You were doubtless well matched. Yet our hunt for this Jagoot demanded our interruption. His talent for escaping us is undiminished, it seems, even to the point of bending a knee in the service of a god. Your defiance of Hood makes you a worthwhile companion. <laughs> it sounds like they've been after Gethel and gotten close a couple of times. What a wily fellow. Is he the Benny of the Jagoot? He just keeps getting away? <laughs> I guess so. What's funny is I love the idea. It sounded like the Amas were ready to just follow him into Hood's realm and kill any Jagoot that may populate that land of Hood just because they're just, they just don't like the Jagoot, for goodness sake. <laughs> Anytime, any place, they'll go. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're ready. They're ready, man. Brucalian grimaced and said, if only to improve your chances of closing with this Jagoot, I take it. Beck Okan said, indeed. Brucalian said, so we are understood in this. Beck Okan said, yes, it seems we are. He stared at the three creatures for a moment, then turned away and said, I think we can assume the Herald will not be returning to us this evening. Forgive my curtness, sirs, but I wish solitude once again. The Talani MS each bowed, then disappeared. Brukalian walked to the hearth, drawing his sword once more. He set the blunt end amongst the cold embers, slowly stirred the ashes. Flames licked into life, the coals burgeoning a glowing red. The spatters and streaks of Jagoot blood on the blade sizzled black then burned away to nothing. He stared down at the hearth for a long time, and despite the unveiled power of the sanctified sword, the mortal sword saw before him nothing but ashes. That's not a good sign. Mm -hmm. Nope. We are taken elsewhere, up from the darkness, a clawing, gasping struggle, explosive blooms of pain, like a wall of fire rising behind his eyes, the shivering echoes of wounds, a tearing and puncturing of flesh, his own flesh. A groan escaped him startled him into awareness. He lay propped at an angle, taut skin stretched beneath him. There had been motion, a rocking and bumping and scraping, but that had ceased. He opened his eyes, found himself in shadow. The air smelled of horses and dust, and, much closer, blood and sweat. Morning sunlight bathed the compound to his right. Soldiers, horses, impossibly huge, lean wolves moved about. Boots crunched on gravel, and the shadow over him deepened. Blinking, Gruntle looked up. Stani's face was drawn, spattered with dried blood, her hair hanging in thick, snarled ropes. She laid a hand on his chest. With a ragged voice, she said, We've reached Kapustan. He managed a nod. She said, Gruntle. Pain filled her eyes, and he felt a chill sweep over him. She said, Gruntle. Harlow's dead. They... They left him, buried under rocks. They left him. And Natak. Natak, that dear boy. So wide-eyed, so innocent. I gave him his manhood, Gruntle. I did that, at least. Dead. We lost them both. She reeled away then, out of the range of his vision, though he heard her rushed footsteps dwindling. Wow. That really sucks to hear Harlow and Natak died. We're finally starting to see a softer side to Stani. It's too bad it took this tragedy to break through her facade. Yeah, agreed. It, it is nice to see her a little softer, but it's yeah, it comes at a cost. Yeah, definitely. Another face appeared, a stranger's, a young woman, helmed, her expression gentle as she said, We are safe now, sir. You have been force healed. I grieve for your losses. We all do, the gray swords, that is. Rest assured, sir, you were avenged against the demons. Gruntle stopped listening, his eyes pulling away, fixing on the clear blue sky directly overhead. He thought, I saw you, Harlow, you bastard, throwing yourself in that creature's path. Between us, I saw, damn you. A corpse beneath rocks. A face in the darkness, smeared in dust. That would never again smile. A new voice. Captain. Gruntle turned his head, forced words through the clench of his throat. He said, it's done, Karuli. You've been delivered. It's done. Damn you to hood. Get out of my sight. 
Kiruli bowed his head, withdrew through the haze of Gruntel's anger, withdrew, then was gone. And thus the chapter ends. Mm. Good chapter. That's a rough ending. Yeah, it is. I'm concerned for Gruntel's mental health here. He already has a drinking problem, and now it seems he's going to blame himself for Harlow's death. So yeah. strong possibility he's going to drink himself into a stupor. Yeah. Gotta go crawl off into a bottle. My assumption too. For standout moments, finding out that there is another force in play that killed 30,000 people in Kalos. What a surprise. Yeah, big wow. Big reveal, big surprise. That's uh, interesting. <laughs> Looking forward to finding out who that is. Yes, me too. The conversation between Karul and Lady Envy. Details about Dasim Ultor. Dasim Ultor. <laughs> I agree. It's... More and more information. It's it's great stuff. <laughs> yeah. More information about Kruald Galane and Starvald Demolane and the imposition of order and then fleshing out the crippled god a little bit more. Yeah. And the question about the imposition of the order, was Cruel maybe already around or did Cruel arise out of the need? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know. That might be one of those things that we have to learn about in Forge of Darkness. Yeah. Or that trilogy. Oh, yeah. I'm looking forward to that finishing someday. <laughs> the converging of the storylines between Ekovian and Gruntel's convoy. It was good to see somebody come along and save them. Yes. Glad to know that they're going to be okay, hopefully. The appearance of the Talan A. It's pretty sad, but still, it's nice to see them. It was really cool. And I, I was moved by that and the fact that the IMAS regret doing this to the Talan A. And, the, you know, learning that these... Uh, that the IMAS, though undead, you know, they're not just, they don't appear just soulless individuals. You know, they're just, that's how they've prolonged their life, but they're still kind of mentally intact in some aspects and they've got emotions and other things tied to them. Mm -hmm. The Grey Sword's ability to draw upon the Destrian's power to heal people. That was a really cool talent. Yeah, it is. Very handy. Very handy for battlefield situations. Definitely. The way Boshlin repaired his carriage and turned it into some eldritch nightmare. So in D&D, &D, is it a constitution roll that you would have to survive before you suffered some ill effect? Is that what it would be? Like going into <laughs> the carriage? Just seeing it, having some kind of impact on you, like, oh. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess if you don't have a sanity check, then yeah, I'd probably have to do constitution. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Gethel, Hood's Herald, and his showdown with the Talani Mass. Dude, that was awesome. And I forgot about Gethel. I just forward remembered something I'm not going to say here <laughs> about him. Brukalian not taking the cowardly way out and staying true to his contract with Prince Jellarkan. That was a real stand up thing for him to do. Very stand up thing. And again, more respect for these great swords. But they're a very chivalrous lot for mercenaries, aren't they? Yeah. They almost seem like knights. Yeah. They don't have a specific king they're serving. But it's, you Ronan. know, whoever's paying them, I guess they, they yeah, a little bit like that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, but I get a real medievalness to them because of the sirs and all the sirs. sirs mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I rag on them a little bit for the way they talk, but unworthy, sir. I will have to try and work that yes, in. Yes, <laughs> Look for opportunities to use that on the uh, podcast. Oh. <laughs> Yes. And in real life, I'm sorry. I will, I will look for ways to use that in real life, too. So, <laughs> yeah, that'd be funny. All right. Great job tonight, Billy. Hey, man. Great, great job. Great episode. You got any final thoughts before we drop off here? I just continue to be astounded at the ever growing lodestone that Captain Stan has become for this staggering amount of ascendant power that is just coming over here, man. Just love this continued as it's casually done too in this chapters the casual escalation you know it's like it's very casual but it's but it's mm. growing it's like the cold war man we're just they're building thousands of nukes they're coming <laughs> mm. so it's like a trickle instead of a fire hose it's just little yeah. by little of this coming together yeah it's pretty wild dude i love it I love yeah it. all right thanks everybody we'll see you next week hey we'll see y'all next week we thank you all for joining us today Again, we'd really like to thank you for taking the time to be with us, and we've had a really great time talking about the topic today. If you would like to support our show, you can find us at horsefrogproductions.com, where you can find our Patreon link. 
Depending on the platform you're listening from, it may also be in the episode description. And if you'd like to contact us uh, through email, it's at contact at horsefrogproductions.com.